There you go. Hi, Sharon, how are you? Renee, wonderful to see you. Uh, everybody's coming on muted. Um, when we get started, I'm gonna ask you to mute yourself again, but if you just wanna say hello now, you can unmute. Hi, Carrie, hi, Amalia, now I see you. I don't know if um, other people ever got to see Miss Nancy in Romper Room, which was, this, always, this moment always reminds me of that. You know, I see she had this big mirror that she held up and as each, she greeted each child. And I see Renee and I yes. see Carrie and I see an Amalia. It's so nice to True. see you all. She Hi, was Carol. an early predecessor to, predecessor to, uh, to Mr. Rogers. Yes, I'm, yes, I'm yes. muting. I'm Lee Hendler, by the way co-founder of Grandparents Network, and we're thrilled to have Marty um, facilitating this conversation today. Yeah, we're gonna just wait a few more minutes. Um, somebody is on who is listed as Galaxy S10. That's me, I don't know how to use the camera. Okay, if you go My name's to, Cindy. If you go to the, if you put your arrow on the bottom left of your screen, You'll see a picture of a camera. If you click on it, we'll get to see your lovely face. Yeah, you know what? It's not just you. I've been having problems with my video. Ah, uh, there's Ruth. Hi, Ruth. Welcome. <laughs> Thank Ruth, you. Yeah, Glad good. To Great to see you. Hello, Roberta. Welcome. Judy, we don't see you, but we'd love to. Ah, uh, there you go. Yep. <laughs> Hi, Fran. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, we've got a nice, good crowd. We're just going to wait about another minute, and then we will get started. There's Julie. There's Sally. Hello. Wow. Hello? <laughs> Hello? 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 Yes, it is. Ruth, if you would just put your camera a little yes, lower, am, we can see only, you better. I only do, you know, teletherapy at this point. One minute. Okay. Yeah, I mean, just because of, you know, COVID, we don't, nobody wants to sit in a small office, you know, we don't. Okay. So, um, Great. Anyway, so what, what's your name? Wonderful. Okay, we're just gonna wait till that person comes back. Okay. So we can I just see if. Well, you can call your plan to make sure I'm on it. There's so many insurance. I want us to mute ourselves. Can I say Yes, I will tell you in a minute. Yes, if you would all mute yourselves, that would be wonderful. We just have to wait till I think it's Fran is on the phone and so talking. Um, it's COVID land, everybody. This is uh, not atypical. Marty, if you go participants, you can mute as the uh, host. You can unmute. Every, you can mute everybody. Who okay, I'm going to try to do that. Uh, okay. I have muted all, so I just ask Ruth. And where did she go? Um, just give me one second. And Erica, if you can unmute yourself, that would be great. So we're going to start. Um, let me first say that uh, I am not David Raphael. David has been hit with a power outage from the storm in Atlanta. So he will hopefully be joining us by telephone, but was not able to be here live visually. So I'm Marty Greenberg. I'm the senior advisor to the uh, Jewish Grandparents Network, a new position, which is a volunteer position. I'm delighted to be here. 
and really delighted to fill in for David uh, today. Uh, as you know, today we're going to be having an amazing Zoom meeting with two unbelievable speakers. And our topic for today is justice, community, and dignity, talking with our grandchildren about politics. I'm assuming that most of you who are on this call, I'll allow you to unmute in a minute, uh, Ruth. Um, I'm assuming that most of you who are on the call are aware, uh, let me just unmute our speakers. I'm sure you're aware that during these crazy COVID times and with the election coming up, this is an amazing time to be having this discussion. We certainly couldn't have chosen it better. Um, I wanna give you some housekeeping details. We're going to be muting everybody but our presenters and we will have an opportunity for follow-up discussion. You'll need to unmute your phone or your computer before asking a question. It's being recorded so that it will be available on our website. And because it's being recorded, we suggest that it would not be a good time to mention your secret bank account in China to your friends. Um, the recording will be available on the website a few days from now. If during the presentation you have any comments or questions, I think most of you probably at this point are familiar with Zoom enough to know that at the bottom, there's a part for chat and that's where you can put your questions in and I'll be keeping track of them. Uh, and you can just click on that to access it. Now, I'd like to introduce our speakers. It's a really, really great pleasure to introduce two remarkable grandparents each of whom is a legend in their own field. Um, before we do that, I'm going to try to unmute all of us. Okay. This is, you know, this is the first time I'm doing this, folks, so please bear with me for two seconds. I'm gonna try to find our speakers and unmute them. Uh, Hold on one second. I'm unmuted. You're unmuted, Erica? Erica, was that you? Yeah. Okay, Thanks. good. Now I'm going to unmute Ruth, and then we can get going. I just have to find her name. Again, I apologize for Ruth. See if you're unmuted now. Okay. Uh, okay, great. So Ruth Messenger, as you well know, served as president of the American Jewish World Service from 1998 to 2016, uh, doing an amazing job and this was following 20 years of career in public service in New York City, where she is literally known by 8 million people. <laughs> Dr. Erica Brown is the director of the Mayberg Center for Jewish Education and Leadership and an associate professor of curriculum and pedagogy at the George Washington University. She is a tremendous Jewish educator who you will be thrilled to hear from. It's a great pleasure for me to now introduce them and take it away, Ruth and Erica. Thank, Thank you, Marty. Thanks. Thank Thanks. all of you for being on. We hope there'll be lots of time um, for people to collect your questions and feed them to us. But we wanna thank Marty for pinch hitting and we wanna thank Lee and David for um, organizing this event. Eric and I have worked together before on several occasions, so we're delighted to be sharing a screen with all of you. Um, Erica, I want you to start off by telling me what you're working on right now in the middle of the pandemic, what an average day for you is like, 
but I want you to include in that presentation a little bit of information about your family since we're talking about children and grandchildren and et cetera. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. And it's, um, I, I want to echo all the thanks that Ruth gave, but a special thanks to Ruth for, uh, for everything she does and continues to do. So it's always such a, an honor and delight to share the space. Um, so uh, right now uh, at the Mayberg Center, we're working on a post-election leadership series. Uh, please go on our website and uh, we have uh, Marty Linsky, Tara Moore, and Marco Greenberg, who are all written uh, extensively on leadership and teach leadership as a way to really think about what the country needs after an election. And I think that's a strength, uh, the strength of leadership, of, of, of strong, thoughtful, um, ethical leadership, no matter what side of the aisle you're on. So that's, um, that's you know, taking up a considerable amount of my time doing some work also on teen leadership and the teen leadership space and just my personal scholarship working on a commentary on the Song of Songs. Nothing like a little love during quarantine. Um, <laughs> so um, uh, started with a class I gave before Passover on uh, song songs and love in the time of Corona and, uh, you know, and expanded. So that's what I'm working on. I would say that, um, you know, most of my days, actually my uh, husband sadly lost his father during uh, Corona this summer. Um, and I've been going to Minion with my husband um, regularly. And that's uh, actually put me in touch with the community, but also put me in a community of mourners, many of whom are, you know, getting up and in the rain uh, under the tent um, praying together, which has been very inspiring. Um, my, um, I am the grandmother of uh, two little ones, uh, both uh, two years old and two to come. And, um, and you know, two is not, not too young to talk about politics with kids, I feel. Um, <laughs> um, you they, know, listen, I, they listen better at that age. <laughs> They listen better and they, it, well, and they don't interrupt, Ruth. Um, right, that's what I mean. Right. Uh, but I, I would say that while I'm not speaking to them directly about politics, and I, I do think a lot about the state of the country. I think uh, I, I'm up at night. Uh, I'm canvassing and making calls. I'm, I fret for the state of our union um, in either direction. I think one of the challenges that all of us have in any leadership capacity and as citizens is to make sure that we stay a unified country after all this, that, um, that there's, there's no violence. And I think I'm, I, I can't say that I speak to my grandchildren about politics right now, but I'm, I, I need to protect a world so that when they are old enough to speak about politics, um, that we'll be proud of where we are as a country. And Ruth, I'll just direct the same question back to you. Um, you're retired and so not retired, Ruth. Um, I, I don't think they could be a retired Ruth, um, but I know that you're balancing a lot. So just give us a little picture and I know you're taking care of grandchildren right now. Um, okay, so the, the, the word comes from my colleague, um, Nancy Kaufman, who was most recently the CEO of the National Council of Jewish Women, now run by Sheila Katz, but Nancy calls it rewirement. And um, so I am rewired um, and was, was and am happily doing many part-time jobs working in the Jewish community or in the um, interconnection between the Jewish community and the justice community. Um, I still do work for American Jewish World Service um, as its global ambassador, but with a focus on rabbinic um, education in leadership and moral courage, which is where you and I have worked together. Mm -hmm. And I do social justice work very briefly at the Jewish Theological Seminary and at the Center for Social Responsibility at the Marlene Meyerson JCC. Um, I recently completed, thanks to you again, Erica, the development of a mm -hmm. curriculum on social justice for Melton schools, which I commend to everybody's congregations. Um, and all of that keeps me more than busy. But on the family front, or first of all, the pandemic front, I guess, all of those part-time jobs have morphed into Zoom jobs. So I spend a great deal of time um, sitting right here um, on my computer, um, happy to talk to a new audience, happy to see some longtime AJWS supporters among our attendees today. One of them is Joanne Price, whom I spoke to yesterday. So thanks for being on the call, Joanne. But my bigger story, always my family is a big story, but I have three children, I have eight grandchildren, and I have three great-grandchildren. 
And because of various parameters of the pandemic, I am now living in my New York City apartment with my husband, my son, my daughter-in-law, my granddaughter, and an eight-month-old great-grandson. So um, he may make an appearance before this is over, but I wish Please, to- we, we want to see him. Bring, as, bring soon as, on. He, as soon as he wakes up, you'll see him. Um, but I would just make note, since people are parents and grandparents on this call, that accidentally we've discovered that, that the real, the secret way to raise a baby is five adults to one infant. That's just about <laughs> right ratio, and it works fine. Um, so that's how we are. But I, but I do will say more seriously for a minute that I give my children huge credit. I give my mother some credit. Some of you know who my mother was, but I consider it. Um, a proud accomplishment that all three children and virtually all of my grandchildren are people who are serious both about social justice and about their Judaism. And some of them are really leading the way and fighting in their own communities. So I hope that I've taught them some things. I hope that I have some answers to today's question, but I want to say when they get to be older than two, um, they teach you a lot also. Mm. Exactly. And actually, I'm wondering just on this call, and you're welcome to drop in the chat so that this is an interactive conversation in a learning community. Um, many people, are, their, their thoughts about grandparenting have really shifted during the pandemic. Some people have not seen their grandchildren in a long, long time. Um, some people are called on to help. Uh, raised their families. My, my right. daughter, who's a, a physician, moved in um, a, a day into the panic for six weeks because she didn't have childcare. So we instantly became uh, the caregivers, as Ruth pointed out. And if you, you know, if you want to drop your grandparenting situation or the change of grandparenting situation um, in the chat room, we'd love to. Both Ruth and I would love to hear about it. Um, so Ruth, you know, I, I think the pandemic, the political landscape. The racial protests and injustice have really have really put many of us into a state of despair, um, and yet grandchildren are really like the the ultimate expression of hope. So I'm wondering what you do that that nourishes you and takes you out of that despair right now. Okay, so first of all, let me just share um, whatever it's called an aphorism or an adage that I created around the time of this election. Um, um, uh, four years ago, and that is despair is not a strategy. And I, I want to amplify that. That does not mean that folks, that you can't feel despair. There are things to feel despair about. And I wouldn't advise it with a, you know, nine-year-old granddaughter, but it's okay to say to your um, adult family and friends and colleagues, I just feel desperate about this situation. Um, but it's not a strategy. And so the question is, feel it, acknowledge it, and then figure out what it is you're going to do about it. And as you figure out what you're going to do about it, that's that's probably the primary place that I urge you to be talking openly and demonstrating by example to your to your grandchildren, to your children, to their friends, what are things that we can do to cope with this current situation. And I guess I want to say one other thing, Eric, and then throw it back to you for a while. Um, but the th I want to say to everyone, and those of you who are, Lee just posted that she's homeschooling some grandchildren, those of you who are with your grandchildren a lot, whether on Zoom or in person, you actually know what I'm about to tell you, but it's easy to forget that they know much more than we think they know. That's always true because they're young and they have inquiring minds, but it's dramatically true in this age of social media, television, webinar, whatever. These kids pick things up. And if we don't talk about them, that is actually talking about them. I wanna make sure that I'm clear about that. If there's some particular things going on in the world when they show up in the first few minutes of news, um, and we don't mention them or we think that, oh, we should wait until the children are out of the room to discuss that headline. They um, are really smart and they're like, how come nobody's talking about this? And I could tell you endless stories about that. I'm going to tell you my favorite quick one. Um, four years ago or whenever it was that there was a huge earthquake in Nepal. The um, head of the nursery school at the JCC, the head of the JCC, Joy Levitt, said that the four-year-olds had conducted a bake sale to raise money for um, Nepal. Um, and they would um, like to give me a check as the head of American Jewish World Service. 
So I went and there was a, you know, they'd had their bake sale. They presented me with a check. We took some pictures and I said to the teacher, I'm just curious to know how you came to raise the issue of an earthquake on the other side of the world with four-year-olds. And she said, oh no, the children raised this to us. They all have Nepalese nannies. Now, who knew that? I wanna say with no disrespect to my community, I bet you that three quarters of those parents did not necessarily know that their nanny came from Nepal or had relatives in Nepal. But again, these nannies who were with these children like 24 seven were doing what they had every right to do. And were saying like, I'm worried about my cousin. There was an earthquake. Um, and the children in this case, healthily came into school and said basically to their teachers, there was an earthquake in Nepal and we need to help. It doesn't always move that smoothly, but I just, whatever's going on, including some of the terrifying things, things that terrify any one of us on this call. It doesn't mean you tell it to children in the same unbridled language that you might use um, with your partner, but it does mean that they know something is up and so we need to find ways to talk about it. And Erica, one of the things that you do so well is figure out ways to embed some of that discussion in Jewish text and Jewish learning. So I hope at some point you'll start bringing in some examples of that. Eric, I can't hear you. Erica, again. if you're there, we're not hearing you. You can't hear her? I don't know what's going on. Erica? And says she's muted, Marty. Thank you. No, you, you, had, you had to unmute me, but thank you. Um, Okay. My husband would like to mute me many times, but uh, I'm sure, but, uh, but sometimes you have to be unmuted. <laughs> um, you know, so to the point about, I, about Jewish texts and also just nourishment in a season of, uh, of, of understandable despair, um, I wanna share something that happened when my grandson was here uh, for the six weeks that he was living with us and we do get to see him often, which I'm, which I'm very grateful. Um, he said, Safti, Safti, which is my grandma in, in uh, Hebrew, um, come upstairs. So he, we walk up the stairs and the washing machine is on and he makes me sit down in front of the washing machine. He tells me to take off my socks and shoes. He takes off his socks and shoes. And for the next half hour, literally, we watched the washing machine. He was fascinated by kind of the turn. And at some point, he just looked up and he said, wow. And, um, and I, you know, I, I, I have never done a wash uh, since uh, the same way. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I like to think of it a little bit within the framework of Heschel's radical amazement, um, Rabbi Heschel's notion of of the profound uh, wonder that we should, should still feel. And as COVID was hitting and, 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 and getting worse across Europe and Israel before it hit here in the, in the spring, you know, we had this magnificent spring and, um, and it would have been so easy not to see it. And he put me in touch, that little line, that little wow put me I'll in touch with the fact that we still live in this beautiful planet, that there's still um, there's still love, there's still um, there's still concern, there's still people who care, there's still people who want to make a difference, and I'll say this um, to Ruth's point: kids do know, and kids also know when you're not being honest with them. I remember when there was a sni the sniper incident here in Maryland; it affected many school children, including my own. Um, some schools had told the students there there's a swarm of bees outside. We have to go inside. And I felt like, you know what's going to happen? <laughs> what's going to happen is those kids are going to find out very soon because uh, they have phones, many of them. They're going to find out what really went on. And then you stop being a trusted broker. And I think one of the things that's amazing about grandparents is that sometimes children, for whatever reason, don't trust their parents, right? They think their parents are withholding things from them and they wanna have a conversation with their grandparent. And that, that bond is extremely, ext I mean, it's extremely special. I can say is um, being very, very close to my own grandparents, my puppy and Sadie, um, who were in my home almost every day after school. Um, I, I felt that in some way, I held on to that generation. It was sometimes it was a, 
bypassing one generation and connecting to an earlier generation in, in like in the very special way that grandparents can. And so if you want to be that trusted broker, you kind gotcha. of have to treat them in an adult way. Um, and, and I, you know, to that, to that point, I mean, you know, I know Ruth that you've, you've had a lot of stories. You just shared, uh, you know, the story of Nepal, which is really a story that speaks of your iconic role in the world that kids, that four-year-olds associate you with taking care of uh, problems uh, globally, um, which we should all have that kind of reputation in the world. But, you know, when you're thinking specifically about this election um, and um, wondering, for example, what you would tell a grandchild, hypothetically, if the parents weren't voting the way that you were voting. I don't know if that applies to anyone on this call, but I think it's an interesting question. Uh, Lee's giving thumbs up, Ellen, thumbs up. No, I think Ruth is uh, somehow muted and I don't know why. I'm trying to get you unmuted, give me a second. That should work now. It does. Yes. Thank you. I'm sorry. Um, it went on mute, Marty, because the eight month old was waking up and I thought I'd uh, let you not hear okay. the noise, but then it stayed <laughs> muted. Okay. So Eric, I heard your question and I think this is exactly, you know, you have to be careful because you need permissions all around um, and you will run into parents um, uh, whose attitude is like that of the, the school and the swarm of bees. That's a terrifying story. But so you can't, if, you know, if you want to be a grandparent who gets invited back, you obviously can't run to talk about things you've been asked not to talk to, talk about. But I think this is a critical issue. I think we need to be able to tell children, we could pick the age, but take this particular issue on issues and particularly on candidates, the joy of living in a place that believes in, we can talk about parameters in a minute, but believes in free speech, believes in democracy, is that people can make different choices. And um, we know, and you can show them any chart, literally every day in the newspaper, many people are voting for this candidate, other people are voting for that candidate. And if it's the case in your own family that the people and the adults in this, in this family don't even agree on who will be the best congressperson or mayor or president, um, we don't agree, but the good news is we each get to, we get to argue with each other peacefully and we get to learn how to argue pleasantly. And then we each get to go and I would say vote for our candidate of choice. And we each get to go and, um, and volunteer. Part of what I'm gonna keep saying on this program is to remember the simple adage, um, you know, do as I do, not as I say. So it, it's important for grandparents in thinking about what they want to share to put um, actual um, activity behind what they're saying they believe in. A lot of us remember, I bet you there, I bet you 80% of the people on this call remember being taken to vote with a parent. Mm -hmm. um, and that's one example, but you know, I'd like for you, if you're making as I did last night with my adult daughter, making telephone calls mm -hmm. into South Carolina on behalf of Jamie Harrison. You know, if you have children at home, let them know that's what you're doing and why you're doing it. Um, uh, I, um, Erica is the text person here, but she knows that I have a handful of totally favorite um, um, uh, texts. And one of them is from Heschel who said that in a free society where terrible wrongs exist, some are guilty, but all are responsible. And that general issue is one that, that children can understand. It's like, who caused the problem? I, your parent or grandparent, don't feel like I caused this problem, but I do believe there are things I can do to help solve this problem. Um, so I see the posting and um, in the chat and Leah is saying that people, kids pick up on the tensions. And the answer to that is, of course, kids pick up on everything. That was my point before. But if you don't acknowledge it, it then becomes something secretive, something not to be mentioned. So you may have to have it out with these other adults because some other adults may believe, oh, they're all too young to know this. But at least point for me is precisely it. The kids will pick up. People are engaged in the election. They're not engaged in the election. People are distracted when the news comes on every night. or well, they're not. People turn off the news because there's carnage. Some of it you don't want children to see. But you have to keep finding ways to talk about that. And saying it's a swarm of bees and not a sniper is terrible. 
but it's also terrible to have to tell children about a sniper. So we're, we're not faced with always yeah. easy choices. Yeah, or, you know, as uh, there's a Holocaust um, historian who calls them choiceless choices, um, which is an interesting expression. I was thinking specifically, Ruth, about the biblical expression, tzedek, tzedek, tirdof, justice, justice, you shall pursue. And there's a lot of different rabbinic interpretations and modern interpretations of this. But, um, but to, to, on, on the point of how we speak about politics, it, the way that I read it is justice, you shall pursue and speak about it in just ways, right? That's the two justice. In other words, one of the things I'm aware of is, uh, you know, people sharing memes and um, and saying terrible things about candidates, um, and I mean gratuitously, you know, awful things, uh, things that 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 aren't proven or aren't true, um, and that goes to both sides of the aisle. Um, I, I I've heard this um, from Trump supporters. I've heard this a lot from. Uh, from Biden supporters, you know, reviling the other side and not giving any legitimacy to an opinion that's not yours. I don't know how you could vote this way. If you vote this way, it means you are like this. And so in the Tzedek Tzedek Tirdof, in the Justice Justice, if we're going to model decency, that's in everything that we say, because precisely because kids pick up on everything. And so they're hearing the way that we talk about things. I actually had just last night, to your point, Ruth, um, my youngest, my 19 year old, who is um, in college um, on my meal plan and her dorm room was recently recarpeted by me because she's upstairs uh, this semester. Um, I was telling her at dinner about a mutual friend, a, a scholar who's isolating alone, who, who shared with me in a call, um, and I actually just want to put out there, if you are, if you are, if you have friends who are quarantining on their own and you haven't made an effort, you really need to make the effort. Right. I mean, this is, this is such an important time. So we're talking about grandparents and grandchildren, but there are plenty of people without grandchildren, without people who regularly call and check up on them. Anyway, so I, I, I called one of these friends and um, she said, I, I can't work. I can barely sleep. I'm so unsettled about the election. I, I, I'm just, I'm in such a depressed state. And my daughter looked up and she said, is that the purpose of all this conversation about politics that, that you can't actually function? What about well-being? And it was really important conversation. And, and, and I, what I understood from that was, and then I said, well, you know, I'm trying to explain her point of view, but she said, look at how much you and, and Abba talk about politics. It's in the morning, it's in the evening, it's a dinner table, it's, it's the news. Uh, don't you think that there's other things to talk about? And I guess it dawned on me that that was the first time she let us know that maybe it was too much. And that maybe, you know, maybe it's not about talking to our grandchildren about politics. Maybe sometimes it's not talking to them about politics, you know, right. choosing what's the right time. And also saying, you know, when I, when, I, when I talk about despair, does that communicate to her that this world is not a place to love? Um, and, and with this last thought, I'll turn it over to you, Ruth. You know, when I was a kid, and I don't know your experience, Ruth, or anyone on the call, um, you know, you were always seen as someone small and unworthy, and the world was a magnificent place that you had to earn and be worthy of. But as I see in the new generation of parenting, it's almost as if the children are the determiners, that they, 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 they guide the conversation, everything is directed at them, they're magnificent, and the world is terrible. And I have to say, though I, I didn't like being small and the world being so great, because um, I think you know we could have grown up with maybe a, a few more compliments. Um, but um, but I I think that that's prefer more preferable than growing up, or that's preferable to growing up in a world where you think the world the world is terrible, is a terrible place, but you're wonderful. I mean that's I mean how how how, how do you walk in a world? Well, so that's the, um, again, you're the scholar, but that's, that's that wonderful teaching about, you know, in one pocket, it says the whole world was created for you. And in the other pocket, it says you are nothing but dust. Right. Um, and part of what I think this whole conversation is about is finding the, the middle way that works for you. And the middle way doesn't mean that you can't be for the, the can this candidate or that candidate. It's like, how do I integrate these concerns into my life? How and where do I talk about them? Am I paying enough attention to self-care? You know, um, I think Erica, you as well, probably some people on the phone, 
are connected to not-for-profit organizations. I work with a vast number of them that happen to be in the Jewish community. But in the last six months, in various ways, many of those organizations, first of all, have pivoted to do some direct humanitarian care and aid. Right. Second of all, I think the wisest of them have done some investment in their staffs, mm. saying like, you know, as a matter of certainty, we definitely won't open this office until at least January 1st, because that's better planning than the people who literally don't know if their children are going to be taught in classroom or online tomorrow. I just think acknowledging all of these anxieties, we're getting pretty far afield, folks, but right. It is a response to, to current events. And I think, you know, Erica, maybe we didn't talk about this when we talked ahead of time, but maybe what we're talking about is that family by family, um, you might need a little bit like to set aside a half an hour. I know how hard it is to find that, but a, of adult shared discussion. If you're talking about like your adult children, so the parents of your grandchildren um, and you, and maybe you and a partner, it's like, what, what are some parameters here? Are we going to watch the news at dinner? Maybe we're not going to do that anymore. Um, you know, how are we going to that moment of rage? And I not, don't want to take this moment away from anybody where Erica did a nice quick imitation before where, you know, you sort of scream, how can you be so stupid? <laughs> um, but you don't want to be doing that in front of kids. Right. And that's not to deny you the moment when you come home and kick the door. But it's to say, like, be careful when and where you do it. You want to suggest to your children. I loved Erica's use of speaking in a just way. I would add to that acting in a just way. Mm -hmm. If you want to work for a candidate, um, your children and your grandchildren, let's talk about grandchildren now, should know what you do. Right. Should know. I mean, I want to relate this to a broader issue for a minute. I think Lee and David will forgive us. And this is maybe a whole other conversation for this series. But do your children now for most of you now it's adult children. Did your children as children do your grandchildren know about your Sadaka activities? Mm. Um, I had, I had much less understanding than I thought I did of exactly how and what kind of charitable money giving my family did um, when I was growing up. I knew how much time they gave to organizations, but they never talked about writing checks to the organizations. And literally it was after they died and I started getting the mail <laughs> that I sort of put together their giving um, profile. And I've been very explicit about those issues with my children and my grandchildren that we give, what we give, how we decide how to give, because that is, by the way, part of, of uh, civic yeah. behavior and politics. And it's, um, I, I want to say one other thing, just Ruth, not really an I, answer. I, but, Ruth, go I, ahead. Like, uh, just to piggyback, because it's not only about money, which I think is, um, it, that's a beautiful example. It's also about the time that people volunteer and being able to talk to your children. Not only I volunteer for this, but this is why I do it. This is what I get out of it. This is what I hope someone else is receiving. Um, those conversations are critically important. And I'll say as someone who's been on a number of boards and, and, and does leadership work, you know, sometimes people are leading or volunteering and they come home and they complain to their children or grandchildren. Oh, about this, you know, oh, I'm a synagogue president and you wouldn't believe what so-and-so said and you wouldn't. And, um, and I once had a guest for Shabbat, a stranger, and um, I was just trying to make a conversation. I said, oh, so are you involved in any volunteer activities? Um, and she said, no, no, I would never do that. <laughs> I was like a little surprising. And I said, oh, is that something that just wasn't a, a value for you growing up? She said, no, my mother was uh, the head of the sisterhood. My father was uh, you know, the synagogue president or whatever it was. Uh, her parents had leadership roles and they came home and they complained about them all the time. So you don't have to tell kids, they just listen, right? They're listening to us. And so, you know, to the extent that we're thinking a lot about the positive speech around our volunteer commitments, but also really explicating for them, this is why I do this. Um, I'm really concerned, Ruth, the day the, on election day and the day after, and perhaps the many days after, that, that a lot of us um, may be upset and that we won't discipline ourselves to talk about this because there'll be a lot of emotion. Um, so and I, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Ruth. I just wanted to add to what you said. Ruth, you're muted, I think.
Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. perfect. Okay. Um, what you do and how you do it, and, and that seems to me, not when you're ranting and raving about what doesn't work, the, the more affirmative parts of that are exactly what you want your grandchildren to know. This is how um, Zadie spends some of her time, his time, sorry. Um, this is what I do. Um, and that goes, by the way, um, for protests. Now, right now, there's some concern about protests. There should be some concern. Don't go and get, don't go and, and risk social distancing rules. Don't go and risk danger. But if there is a peaceful protest, that is, folks, in the spirit of um, um, American uh, democracy. And, and um, children should know about it. I'm about to introduce you all to a friend. So you'll just have to wait one minute. He is enamored of conferences and Zooms because he gets to see everything. So you didn't realize when we're talking about grandparents and there'd be a live demo. Right. I, I, went, I went to get one. What we're going to do right now is we're going to watch how Ruth talks to her grandson about politics. <laughs> but, but oh, yeah, is he cute? Justice. <laughs> At least he didn't cry. Ruth, what's um, his name? No, he'll be here for a little while and somebody will take him. Um, um, no, I, I, I'm, I'm actually enjoying this conversation because I think that it really is a question of, of conscious behavior and talking about what to do. I want to say one other thing. Um, Erica was talking to me and if I go off, if I deviate from the order we were pursuing, um, you'll bring us back. But I, I want to say to all of the people on this call uh, who are of a certain age, um, we have to remember how much we've lived through. I'm not suggesting all of it good, or all of it bad, but I'm saying if you think of something like, for example, nonviolent civil disobedience, if you think about something about um, 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 the, the impact of a march, somebody just talked about going to Washington for Soviet Jewry, if you think about um, peaceful elections. If you think, which I actually think a great deal about these days, that we actually got through the election of 2000, which was scary for most of us. Mm -hmm. Remember that we're talking about children who have seen nothing except what's going on in the last year or two. And we're even talking about, um, you know, I remember um, uh, at any given moment in the history of the United States, when we, and I'll put, I'm leading myself in that, organizers are really interested in being sure that 18 year olds vote. One thing that you have to remember, two things you have to remember. One is like, how much of, of the history of America has that 18 year old actually seen in her or his lifetime to understand the trajectory? And the other thing, which I complained to Erica and Lee and David about extensively is we don't teach civics anymore. Yep. So we'd be happy to hear some counterexamples from some people's schools or school systems. But by and large, I look, I, I work at the Marlene Meyerson Jewish Community Center on the west side of Manhattan. And with the current Manhattan Borough President, a position I used to hold, we've taught a course every fall, a four session co course called Everything You Wanted to Know About City Government But Were Afraid to Ask. And the people who take that class are huge activists between the ages of 30 and 70. And they are constantly, I didn't understand that. I had no idea about that. What, why are the rules the way they are? What is that position that she is running for? So it's staggering that, we're, <laughs> that we've managed to do this. And you know, everyone knows what's going on outside our windows right now. So the one thing I'm hopeful for is a huge increase in numbers. But I will tell you that in the last three presidential elections in this country, the average percentage of the voting age population that's shown up to vote was 56%. Yeah, I mean, Ruth, can I, if, if I wanna jump in on that, on that point, um, I don't imagine that any of us as grandparents have said, oh, I'm gonna be your civics instructor. Um, but on some level, maybe that is an important role for all of us to play um, when kids, and I, I, I wanna make a distinction between politics and government. Um, I think that, you know, when we think about, when our kids think about and our grandchildren think about politics as some kind of yelling session, you know, just, I, you know, the first debate, I, I just cringed at what, what we had descended into. And that, and then associating that with understanding the way the government works, 
understanding that the way Congress works, being able to, to kind of provide some very basic structures uh, to our grandchildren about the way that healthy governance works. I think that's, that's a role that maybe some of us don't think about. We think about uh, who, who am I voting for and why, as opposed to how does, this, how does this all come together to represent the amazing democracy that America is? And maybe, it's, maybe part of this is infusing, um, there's a, an, an expression, Rabbi Nachman expression, um, that comes from the, uh, the Talmud in Baba Metzia, that you fix yourself and then you, uh, and then you fix others. And um, the way Rabbi Nachman explained that is you take a ball and you throw it against a wall and sometimes it doesn't hit where it's supposed to hit, but it bounces back to you. And in terms of thinking about hope within that framework, maybe talking about the privilege of being an American, um, the, the beauty of it, the beauty of democracy, of American, the importance of patriotism, it may, it may go beyond our grandchildren and our children, but it may bounce back and give us a sense of infusion and, and, a, and a sense of hope. Um, I, I want to, with your permission, Ruth, um, I want to open up uh, for any questions or observations or comments or Absolutely. stories. Um, and, and Marty, if you'll let people unmute themselves, that'd be terrific. Yes, uh, you should be able to unmute yourself for those who don't know how to do it. <clears throat> Go to the bottom of your screen to the left. You'll see a little micro microphone. Just click on it and it should allow you to speak. No, while you're while you're preparing remarks, I just want to respond. You're welcome to drop questions into the chat or thoughts um, from Ruth. Maybe we've complained about Judaism and Jewish customs to our kids, um, and therefore turn them away. Um, so it's not only about you know volunteer activities or leadership. It may be much uh, you know much broader than that. Um, and Julie talks about you know marching and protesting and 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 bringing children to protest and going to protests. Um, you know, someone told me, a uh, 26-year-old from uh, Brazil once stood up in an audience where I was teaching, and she said, the problem with the Jewish community today is we have so many organizations and so few causes. Um, and I was very, very struck That's by that. As someone, yeah. yeah, someone who, I think my, my political activism came in high school fighting on behalf of Soviet Jewry and really being so immensely involved. And then I remember going to the National Mall and I remember when um, Sharansky was left free and I took my Anatoly Sharansky bracelet off and I took the Anatoly Sharansky poster off my wall. And I thought there is nothing our people can't do. Um, and that's, that's why I do what I do. And I, I imagine that some of you may also have been inspired by the Soviet Jewry movement or other movements where you felt that feeling there's nothing we can't do uh, when something works. Julie, you're shaking your head. You wanna jump in? You want to unmute and jump in? I think people are having a problem unmuting. Marty, is there a way for you to unmute everybody? Let's see. And then you can mute yourself. Huh. Try to unmute yourself while I'm working on this, please. Um, um, Erica, while we're waiting, uh, a few minutes ago, Lee posted that we asking that we talk a little bit about the Jewish value of community, which I think yeah. I would punt over to you. Um, yeah. Um, so it's interesting. I, th I think one of the things that we all have to give thought to is how do we how do we maintain a unified community after the election? This concern about violence after the election. Um, and on one level, historically, you know, if you're a student of Jewish history, you know that we've never really been unified, right? We, we just haven't, you know, we haven't been unified. But we've also been respectful questioners. And um, I, I've been working on a, on a civics project, uh, looking at principles of the Talmud as a basis for different kind of civic interaction and social justice interaction. And uh, I've derived 10 principles. I just wanna share a few of them with you because I think communities that are healthy know how to argue in a healthy way. And when you think, uh, the, the Talmud is, is, is not filled with conclusions, it's filled with questions. And there's a Yiddish expression, you don't die from a question, right? And, was, and I think there's a posture of curiosity that's really integral to maintain right now, which isn't why are you doing that, but 
help me understand, you know, why you think the way that you think. And that's a very vastly different. So I, I just want to share a few principles and then um, hopefully we'll have you unmuted by then or really drop questions in the chat or observations. Um, one of the things that the Talmud frequently does is defines the terms. Um, it comes up to an issue and then asks, you know, for clarification and understands that something that may be obvious on the surface is not so obvious. So one of the things I, I just want to think about is in thinking about civics and our community is sometimes we don't take the time to define the language that we use define the terms. I, this is particularly important and something I, I think about because I teach at GW around diversity training and racism, right? It was, we don't always think about the terms that we use and the potential pain and the trigger, the re-triggering that can happen as a result of using uh, the wrong language. Um, I think in, in Talmudic parlance, we reward the question more than the answer. Um, you know, and I think being able to help children and grandchildren ask good questions. And you know, we don't always have good answers for them. And we think if I don't have a good answer for this, we're not even gonna start this conversation. And that happens so often in politics, right, Ruth? And you just say, well, you know what? I don't have an answer for you, but that's a really good question. And let's actually try to refine that question and get that question even better. I don't know if you remember Ruth and Susanna Heschel's collection on Jewish feminism. Cynthia Ozick wrote, a, wrote an, an essay that had a huge influence on me called Towards the, I think it was called Towards the Right Question. She said, if you keep refining the question, you sometimes get to an answer by asking a better question. Um, and um, no, I, think, I think it's, yeah. I think I would just say this is something that we need to encourage. It's Talmudic for sure, but we're not most of us Talmudic in our in our uh, constitutions or our presentations, and it's it's a fine art of yeah. dialogue and Q and A. Um, my colleague Rabbi Stephanie Rusquet, who's the uh, associate dean of the Rabbinical School at the Jewish Theological Seminary, um, was raised by her dad, who asked her every night when he put her to bed, um, "Tell me what question you asked today." Mm. And I just always found that the most positive example of thoughtful parenting, grandparenting. It's like, yeah. you know, what's the question, where did you raise it? How do you have it? Did you pose it to the people who might have the answer? Because the world is full of questions that don't have immediate answers. And I think part of what we're talking about folks is not the, not the easy one-off, like how do you get through the next five days without having a meltdown? Um, um, or when do you turn off the television because the news is, is too overwhelming, but how do you think coherently about those fantastic oh, grandchildren that you have? and what are a couple of values that you'd like them to inculcate? And by the way, we did not do it for this call, but you know, there are children's books on all of these issues. There's um, Ibram Kendi who wrote the book, How to Be an Anti-Racist has written a book for children about anti-racism. Um, there are, you know, there are books about, and, and certainly for slightly older children, there are biographies about, um, about um, social change, there are, you know, histories of, um, people who stood up for making change in peaceful and just ways. Um, and those are all things that grandparents can take some ownership of and look to, to read, to talk about, or as Erica says, to pick one of the values that um, she, she's sharing from her um, text work and saying, just talk about this. This is a Jewish value. Let's talk about what it means. Um, we, we, none of us is good enough in um, honoring the notion of B'Tzel and Elohim. We put people into categories, we define them by their race or their religion or their color or whatever. And we tend to make general statements of like, they are all, mm. or I don't like this group because instead of what we need to be reminding ourselves and our peers and our children and our grandchildren, which is that every human being is equally made in the image of whomever you believe made you and needs to be approached that way with a spirit of positive inquiry. Yeah, Ruth, to that point, I, I wanna share that my grandchildren have um, Kendi's book, How to Be an Anti-Racist. Um, it's totally inappropriate for two-year-olds naturally, but I would say it's inappropriate for 10-year-olds also. It was, I think it was trying to take an adult concept and it just, and it stayed adult. Um, so, you know, the word access, you know, that's, these are hard, sophisticated concepts. And I'll say that among, um, you know, in studying certain social activists who've, who've uh, been very important in the world, not only in the Jewish world, um, 
one of the things that nurtured their activism was reading stories, powerful stories about heroes. And um, I think today we emphasize too much on anti-heroes. Um, and I think being able to share stories, whether it's uh, repurposing a biblical story, um, a David and Goliath type of story, uh, an Exodus type of story, um, an immigration story. I, th I think I think stories and that, you know, it, it, you know, getting to the Talmudic principle point, um, the Talmud illustrated often its legal points with stories about what particular scholars did, um, because they understood that it's not enough to say don't be this but you kind of got to show it with the way that people live in the real world. And to the degree that we can identify, and, and maybe this is, again, solace for despairing times, identifying sources of our own inspiration and being able to share them and, and, and share them in detail. I think that that's, who, who are my heroes? Let me tell you who my heroes are. Let me just interrupt for a second. Julie, yeah. see if you can unmute your, uh, yourself now. Ah, success. There you go. Go ahead. Okay, so I was going to ask a question about um, consensus, because one of the things that uh, I always remember uh, thinking about with a democracy is that, you know, people talk to each other and they come to some kind of consensus. It seems like we're very far away from that. And I wondered if there were Jewish texts that actually spoke to that. Um, Ruth, I have something to say, but I want to see if you have something to say. Um, um, well, nothing comes to mind immediately um, about say, speaking the value of consensus, but the whole tradition that Erica represents for me, which is the, the history of our people of healthy argument and dispute and debate for 6,000 years is a piece of all of this, which is like if in discussion, you try to arrive, if you, were, if you end up with a difference of opinion, you try to characterize why that difference exists so that everybody can be respectful of everybody else's point of view. And that's what Erica was talking about before. That's so much what we don't do today. We put people in boxes, they put us in boxes. We assume that there's no common ground. Um, and part of what I've been saying and some of the organizing I've been doing is just to remind people of two things. One is there are no perfect people, so there are no perfect candidates. And the other one is, um, oh, no. Um, you are not likely going to find colleagues with whom you agree on every point. So if you're going to go out to work with people on an environmental cause, you may actually find that you support different candidates or that you have a different approach to how to, how to cope with the pandemic in your own household. But if you, obviously, if it's somebody you disagree with violently, that's one thing. But, but if you have a common cause that you want to work on together, that in and of itself is an example to children about how to build community and consensus as in so far as possible. We yeah. have about five minutes left. <clears throat> if someone else and has a way, question. If you have access to the chat, Lee is posting some of the work she does around um, Jewish Haggadot for American slash Jewish holidays. Very good. The next thing coming up is Thanksgiving. So yeah. Ruth, I see you have a question. Sorry, no, Lee, were you about to say no, something? No, 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 Ruth, go, go with Ruth's question. I posted what I needed to. Okay, okay. Ruth. I, I am just um, thinking as I listen to you and I put in the chat that very often, like we, we love the, the radical years, how we tore things down and it was so energizing. So that's what we talk about instead of the tedious work of building things up. And um, I think a great example with our grandchildren, if you're ever doing a household renovation, you know, in the first day they tear that bathroom apart and you think the job's gonna be done in two days. <laughs> and then it takes four months for them to put the bathroom together. And that's such a great metaphor for the kind of work we do. And I think someone mentioned heroes and anti-heroes. So the hero is really often the one who just odds along, doing that boring work that builds it up. Um, and I just wanted to emphasize that, that that's a really important concept and a really tough one because it's, it's not energizing. It's not sex, sex. It's tough. Absolutely. I think that's, I think that's beautiful, Ruth. And again, for some of you, at least, 
you can connect that metaphor, which is great, also to work you do. It goes back to you know Erica's statement, not not coming home and complaining that the sisterhood didn't reach an agreement on a critical issue in, in a half an hour, but telling people, you know, it's a long process, but there's gonna be discussion and debate and we're gonna get there and we're gonna shape policy. I'm working on issues of race and racism at the Jewish Theological Seminary. And we actually said to people this summer, we don't have the answers. We are going to open up discussion groups where people can think and talk about issues of race and racism. And out of that will come some new and affirmative steps that we can take together to make this, um, to work on this parameter. But we, there are no immediate answers. So I really like that position and that metaphor. Yeah, actually, just to, to that point, and then maybe I guess we'll, we'll, uh, we'll close for the day. Um, so my 10th principle is embrace praise and preserve uncertainty. So to Julie's point, um, the idea, many Talmudic arguments end with what's called a teku, which is really a, in the future, this will get resolved, but it's not getting resolved now. And you could, you could actually say, well, if it's not getting resolved, why do we preserve a minority oh. opinion that we don't follow? Well, one day in the future, that may be valuable. Um, for all of us who may be voting one way and criticizing the opponent in a way that is total, um, I, I really encourage you to find something in that minority opinion, the opinion that you, the, the, the candidate that you're not following and be able to praise it. And I think that's a challenge this year. That's a real challenge, but it's a challenge that says um, Judaism has invited me to, to engage in a posture of curiosity that I can preserve and praise an opinion that is not my own and that I can redeem um, opinions that, um, that I may not hold um, personally. I think, I think that's, that's about the spirit of listening because at the end of the day, we'll have this election, we'll have many, many more elections. We'll get stronger, right? Um, but as a Jewish community, we have been around for so many thousands of years and we have survived. And we, we want to just preserve what has been great about us, our capacity to adapt, our capacity to engage the other. And uh, just to end on one Hebrew note, uh, the word achrayut, responsibility, comes from the word acher, the other. Uh, and the other isn't the one who I agree with. Um, so thank you. Erica, and Ruth, last words. Um, well, no, I think I think I think you have my last word. We have to. Well, I guess I would say since Erica is such yeah. a helpful yeah. student for all of us, just to remember that the rabbis said yeah. in the debate about which is more important, study or action. They said that study is more important because it leads to action. So we want you to investigate these issues with your grandchildren, but then find things you can do with them, not necessarily in the next five days, although maybe but certainly in the next year to be out and, and work on where are we as a country? What do we as a family or what do you as a young person care about particularly and what are ways to act on that issue in a, in a just fashion, in a thoughtful fashion, but to do something other than to despair. Amen. Thank you. Uh, I, I want to thank on behalf of the network both Ruth and Erica, who I think just did an amazing job. I took extensive notes. I'm sure you did as well. Uh, my grandmother, as my sister who's on this call will tell you, was the most important influence in our lives. And yeah. you can be that for your grandchildren. And I think it's incredibly important. So I wanna thank both of you for a wonderful, wonderful seminar. <laughs> I'd also like to recognize Lee Hendler, who you most of you know up at the uh, top of your screen or my screen, who uh, made all of this possible in helping to create this wonderful institution of the Jewish Grandparents Network. And also David Raphael, who may be on the phone call, though I have no idea, who is the amazing executive director. I also just wanna tell you that on Thursday, November 12th, we're going to partner with Hagadot.com to host a virtual discussion on ways that we can infuse Thanksgiving with deeper meaning for our families, especially during COVID. And the webinar is based on the work Lee has done, the amazing work in her Freedom's Feast project. <clears throat> more information will be available in a few days. You can find out more about Freedom's Feast at freedomfeast.us. 
Uh, but the 220 Thanksgiving material is not posted yet, but it will be. So again, my thanks for, to all of you for participating. And I want to wish you all a safe and healthy and excellent voting season. And if you haven't voted, please go out and vote. But thank you so much. Thank you very much, Marty. Thank, thank you. you Take care, Marty. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye.